So you're here to learn about partnering with us, oh, not partnering with us, about working with us at Assured Global Consulting today, right? Y'all want to conquer college admissions. So we're gonna give you the real talk about that. So the first thing that I want y'all to understand about Assured Global Consulting is that at Assured Global Consulting, we have an unequal team with unrivaled experience when it comes to the world of college admissions. Like Ms. Uganda stated, my name is Lintaro Donovan. I serve as Managing Director at Assured Global Consulting. I'm a Dartmouth 24. I just finished up my freshman year. I've also been a National Merit Scholar. I got a perfect score on my PSAT, along with a near perfect 1580 on my SAT. I've also worked on Capitol Hill for a former leader of Congress, and I'm currently a writer for the Dartmouth Review, which is Dartmouth's independent, nationally recognized newspaper. Sharyar. Hi. Yeah, so my name is Sharia. I'm an incoming freshman at Duke University. I've also done research internships at the University of California, Los Angeles, as well as University of Pennsylvania Wharton. Um, in high school, I was a machine learning researcher, and I was also a debater and public speaker, uh, like said before, and I was also the number one clarinetist in the state of Maryland. Got him. Hi, my name is Gautam. As previously mentioned, I'm going to the University of Maryland and enjoying their full ride. Currently studying computer science and math. I have a lot of experience in just the research field, having done research for both the United States Navy and also uh, my current school. And currently I'm also working for two software development jobs. So I have a lot of experience in the private industry too. Thank you so much, Gautam. Another thing that I want y'all to understand about Assured Global Consulting is we have a plethora of experience when it comes to getting into American schools. You know, when we applied, we had great success. That's partly why we started this firm. I got into Dartmouth College, an amazing Ivy League university. Sharyar and Gautam got into these small liberal arts colleges like Amherst College and Williams College. And together, we also got into really large state universities. So we developed this expertise of success across all colleges in the American college spectrum. But frankly, that success is not the reason why we started this firm. You see, a lot of our friends, including many international students with great personalities, great accomplishments, great stories, despite all of that, they could not get into the same schools that we did simply because they lacked the knowledge of how to present themselves in the college applications process. They didn't know what admissions officers looked for. And so they didn't know how to put their best foot forward. They didn't know how to maximize their chances at these life-changing opportunities. We think that's horrible. We think that's a worldwide issue. It affects international students from any country, but most especially from a country like India. And we started Assured Global Consulting to address that issue and make sure that any student especially international students who want to study in the United States can accomplish that opportunity by putting their best foot forward. So how do we accomplish our success in the college admissions process? Well, as the slide says, it wasn't just luck. Today, we're going to explain to you step-by-step step how we made sure that our chances at getting into Harvard or Yale or any of the schools on that list were maximized. So first things first, let's do a little thought experiment. The picture on the left, does anyone know what those mountains are? Feel free to answer in the chat, it's sort of a rhetorical question. Probably not. On the other side, we have another picture. I'm guessing you probably know the name of that mountain, or you probably know that it's one of the tallest in the world. That is of course, Mount Everest. So my question to y'all, I want y'all to think about this, You know, take a second or two. Why do we know the name of that mountain? Why do we know what it looks like? Why do we know that it's spectacular? Why is it in our heads while those other mountains could be anywhere in the world? Why do we know Everest, but not those other mountains? Hmm. Well, quite frankly, because Everest is extraordinary. Everest stands at 29,032 feet. It's the tallest mountain in the world. Meanwhile, those other mountains, which are known as the Blue Ridge Mountains, I happen to live 100 miles or so away from them, they're a pretty average mountain range. 
There's over 125 peaks in the Blue Ridge Mountain Range that are over 5,000 feet. And the tallest one is only 6,684 feet. As you could tell from that photo, all of the peaks are pretty similar. You can't really identify them. There's nothing really setting them apart. Guys, that's the core to this college application process. Everest is extraordinary. It stands apart. The other mountains don't. You wanna stand out. You have to be Everest. And that leads us to a very simple truth. Colleges want good students, but they don't seek out just ordinary good students. As the statistics show, in 2020, Brown, 96% of admitted students were in the top 10% of their high school class. At Dartmouth, the average test score for my class was 1501 for the SAT. At UChicago, the average was a 1518. That's one of the highest averages in the country. And the average ACT was 34. What I wanna stress here is that excellent test scores, excellent grades, excellent quantitative academic achievements, those are not things that get you into American schools. They are the basic requirement to be considered by American schools. So any student with those test scores is not guaranteed admission to a Brown, to a Dartmouth, to UChicago. But those with incredible, extraordinary accomplishments attached to their name, like those two Jeopardy winners, like that NASA presenting researcher, they have more than a good shot at getting into those schools because they're not just ordinary good students. They're good students who combine their academic profile with something that makes them extraordinary, like Everest. And that brings us to the idea of your application narrative. Parts of your application should together paint a cohesive picture of who you are, what you wish to accomplish, where you come from. When an admissions officer reads your application, they should in a way be reading you. They should know you after they read every page. And they wanna answer three essential questions when you submit your application and they take a look at it. One, what is your passion? We call this the spike. You can think of it as your Everest. What is that thing that's gonna make you the tallest in the world at something, the best in the world at something? What is the thing that's gonna make you stand out against all those other applicants? Second, they wanna know how have you pursued that passion in high school? They're not gonna take it just on the basis of your word that you love particle physics or you love studying Asian history. They want to know that this is something that you have already accomplished stuff in, that you have a track record in this, and that that track record might serve as evidence of major contributions that you can make to that field in college. Which leads into the third question. With that spike, with that passion, how will you continue pursuing it in college? More generally, they want to know what will you contribute to that class? But I stress, do not fall into the trap of repetition while you build this cohesive picture. Minimal space in the application is a thing. You can't get around it. There's going to be word limits. There's going to be limits on how many pages you can submit, what you can submit as supplementary material. Remember, admissions officers are busy. They don't want to get 15 pages of you know, extra details about what activities you do, what your passion is. So you have to maximize the amount of detail that you express within the limited format of a common application with maybe a couple supplement questions. Each component of your application must reveal a new side of who you are to the reader. If you're a particle physicist, that's your passion. That's what you want to study at Caltech or Stanford. Feel free to make your common application personal statement solely about how you fell in love with physics and how physics is the essence of who you are. But don't spend another supplement talking about that in the same terms. Maybe talk about how you applied particle physics to an extracurricular activity, like building a nonprofit. Maybe talk about how physics has informed your family life. Maybe you have a very interesting philosophy on human interaction, whatever. All that matters is that you're adding different pieces to that puzzle that the entire application forms. 
They don't want to read about how you are a particle physicist doing research at a local university or you read this textbook 50 times. They want to learn about how you're a budding particle physicist who also loves this genre of music and also loves to read this type of book. And you can't wait to share that book with your roommate at Harvard or Stanford. Let's make it very clear, students. In the application process, you're not just competing against yourselves, against people in your city, against people at your school, people in your country, but you're competing against people in the world. Every year, Harvard College receives more than 40,000 applications. When you sit down to start writing your applications, hopefully with our help, you have to ask yourself a question. How can you be that one in 40,000 applicants that the Harvard admissions officer tells to the admissions committee, we need him. This student is someone that Harvard College needs. How are you gonna stand out? How can you maximize your memorability and your luck at getting remembered? I'm gonna be very clear. Luck plays a role in this process. If an admissions officer had a bad day, he reads your application, no matter how much you contribute, it just might not get through because he had a bad day and he's not in the mood to accept anyone. But if you can write a stellar, personal, inspiring application, then it might even have the ability to get through bad days and bad luck. And when your admissions officer is not in the mood to accept anyone. And that's where we can talk, right? This process is all about maximization. And ending really quickly, I wanna make clear, the best application narratives are not three pages long. They're not five pages long. The best application narratives are simple, just a collection of ideas about who you are and how you wanna express that to the college admissions officers. They can be summarized in just one sentence. Which brings me to my own application narrative. As you may have guessed, I love government. So my narrative was having worked at the highest levels of American government that I sought to restore America's civic engagement, our democratic culture, which has taken quite a hit over the last several decades. In every single part of my application, I tried to take an experience, an award, an activity I did to evidence that narrative as best I could. So I used my Capitol Hill internship, working for a former leader of Congress. That gave me a credibility I worked literally in the heart of America's democracy for a leader of American democracy. In a YMCA program, I also had the opportunity to serve as an elected representative of the youth in my state of Maryland. I served as youth governor. That gave me even more credentials, but also an amazing experience actually building up voting capabilities and voter registration for students in my state. It gave me a way to talk about how I've actually helped restore America's civic engagement, even at 17 years old. I'd also won several awards. I actually won second place in an international contest with more than 5,300 competitors for a documentary I produced called Democracy Must Be Learned about the importance of civics education in building a healthy and strong voting youth. I'd also won a national award, and this is something that I was most proud of. I was selected as one of 106 students nationwide for the United States Senate youth program. This was something that I had my eye on from freshman year. And by, by golly, it just happened to fall into my lap when I just started applying in my senior year. This is something that I also want to stress. Over the course of your high school experience, some of you might be freshmen, sophomore, juniors, seniors. Over the course of your high school experience, you're probably going to fall into this trap of being anxious, thinking you need to have this award, you need to join this club, you need to have this grade, that test score. But I promise you students, as long as you stick to one passion and pour yourself into that passion, the awards, the extracurriculars, everything will come naturally. The key to this process is specialization while also maintaining a good academic base. That's what I did. That made me academically qualified. My activities, my awards, they made me memorable and they made me accomplished. So the effect I had on admissions officers was this. I became the civics kid. When they went up to the admissions committee, they didn't have to say my name. They didn't even have to hear it. They just knew that there was the civics kid 
who could contribute to campus on voter registration, on democracy, on whatever, and they knew that the college had to have it. That's the effect that you want to have on your college admissions officer. And now Sharar and Gautam are going to talk about their personal narratives. Winning multiple national and international programming competitions, I hope to use my experience to work on disruptive startups. This was the narrative that I wanted to get across. And at first, it's a very grandiose claim. If you look at the evidence, you might be able to take away some idea that this would be possible for me, but it was still lacking something. As Lintara mentioned earlier, part of me, even though I had all of these competitions, were still anxious about the other awards I didn't have. But that wasn't what was important. And this plays on specialization. Within my experiences, I needed to find a better narrative, a better story, something that highlights the fact that I actually wanted to work on these disruptive startups, something that to my very core has motivated me. It's what I've learned through all of my experiences. And throughout my entire application, I wanted to create the effect that I was an innovative disruptor and I would be the prime fit for this prestigious program or this school. And so with my evidence and with all my experience, the story I was able to convey to all of the schools that I got into, and a lot of them were very competitive STEM programs, was that by bringing the student who has all this great experience in CS, but also this drive in computer science and experience to actually make change, I would be able to do something. I would be able to bring new ideas to the school. And with these ideas, I bring new conversations and conversations that the school actually wants to have. It's this effect and this idea of actually bringing change to the school that led my application be very selective and very appealing to these top schools. Right. So personally, my application process centered a lot around a different group of activities. I had done multiple things. And although it's best to specialize in one thing, if you do a lot of different things and find a way to thread all of those things together, you can be in a prime position to succeed. For example, in addition to doing public speaking, I was also a musician and I had started a very large organization within my school that had led me to statewide leadership. But the thing that brought all those things together wasn't the fact that I did all these activities. It was my approach to them because I was always the one who did things differently from other people. I took a separate avenue on every single project that I took. And that's what I illustrated in my common application essay, not by speaking about any of my particular extracurricular activities, but I actually about speaking about a recess that I had had when I was in elementary school that illustrated my personality. And then every other essay, I talked about how I approached an activity with a mindset of change. For example, I co-founded an organization for teaching debate as a way of learning English fluency. That's not something everybody does. A lot of people start debate organizations, none of them with that specific mission. I also designed new methods for personal improvement in both music performance and public speaking. I did many different forms of public speaking and tied them together. I played multiple instruments and tied those together. See, when I brought my application forth to schools like Duke and Berkeley and UCLA, I showed them, I showed them that I was a leader in the world of change. That was enough to get through. All right, now on this next slide, we're gonna have a lowdown on the interview. If, uh, okay, thank you. Um, so yeah, we're gonna talk about the interview now. It's nothing more than a 30 to 60 minute conversation with a college alumnus. A college alumnus is somebody who recently graduated to, from the school and is now trying to give back to the school by doing a few interviews here and there. A bad interview can really hurt your application, more so than a good interview can help it. Um, but if you really have an excellent interview and you really come across to the interviewer, then they can put in a good word for you. Because remember, that's actually how the interview works. The interviewer, the college alumnus, writes up a one-page summary of their conversation with you and their beliefs about your personality and sends that over to the admissions officer who will say something along the lines of, oh, we had a good interview. Oh, we had a bad interview. Oh, we learned this from the interview. Oh, we didn't really learn about this. 
Um, but they really want to gain in your demonstrative interest from the interview as well. They want to know that you really want to go there, which is why you should be ready to ask your interviewer questions at the end of the interview. Don't ask something that you can ask to Google, all right? Don't ask how many students attend your school or what's the acceptance rate. Ask something personal, you know? What kind of experience did you have with this club? What's something you could have done or what's something you wish you had done if you could go through the whole process again? Every college has different guidelines as to how the interview works and how you contact them. Usually it starts out with the interviewer reaching out to you via email and then you responding with the time that you're available to talk. Then the interview taking place and then here's the key part, you really have to send them a thank you note after the interview is over, 24 to 36 hours later. Just something along the lines of, hey, thank you for speaking with me. I know you have a lot going on in your life working at McKinsey or Facebook or Goldman Sachs, but the fact that you took 20 to 30 minutes or 20, 30 to 60 minutes to speak with me uh, really ended up helping me learn about the school and now I'm more excited to go there. Let's look at this next slide with um, the, for, the, the purpose of the interview. Now, colleges use the interview to do, I think, four different things. First is to pinpoint your reasons for applying to the school. Why are you, a student at El Pro International School, interested in attending Brown University? It's very far from you. who will have to go to another country, like a 14-hour flight. What exactly is it? Now, the wrong answer is to say something like, oh, the school that I would be going to in, the U in India isn't really good enough for me or doesn't really meet my needs. There are great schools in India, and your admissions officer knows that. They want to know specifically the good things about U.S. colleges that drag you there. Maybe it's the fact that Brown has one of the best computer science programs in the country, and you really want to do that. Or maybe it's because of the open curriculum, which is an unrivaled experience to choose your own academic pathway. Explain why you want to go to this school, and also why you want to leave your home country to go to the U.S. What brings you there? What attracts you? And they want to identify the specific contribution that you're going to make to the school. All right. I asked, I was asked multiple times in my interviews, what are you adding here? And I answered it differently every time because I truly felt that for every school that had a different set of opportunities, I could add something new. Sometimes it provided a concrete answer. I'm going to establish this social action organization for educational policy reform. Other times I told them that I was going to add a sense of humor that's really lacking when students talk about. Um, difficult issues, because that's something that my teachers have told me that I was skilled at. Then they want to evaluate your English fluency. This is something that didn't really apply to us, but that applies to you. They want to know that you speak English well enough, not just to explain your life, but to also have a deep, meaningful, meaningful conversation that could eventually be taking place in a coffee shop with your roommates or in a classroom with your teacher. Then finally, they want to gain insights about your personality and intellectual attitude. This is the part that could really hurt you, right? If you don't ask good questions, or if you have your camera off during the entire interview, or if you don't really respond well to the questions that the interviewer asks, they're going to kind of feel like your personality isn't worth having on campus, and that can really hurt you. Instead, show why you have a good personality. Talk about the things you're really excited about, and that'll get you there, right? Instead of talking about you know, a field of science that you're not interested in, talk about the thing that interests you most, right? When I spoke about um, public policy during my in interviews, I was really energized. I was really excited. My true personality came out. That's what helps me illustrate myself to the reader. All right, let's take a look at some of the questions on the next slide that you might see in the interview. Here's the first one. What attracts you to intended major? Don't just say, I like it because I can make a lot of money off of it, even though that may be true if you're a computer science major. Instead, say something like, oh, you know, from the first time I built a computer, I really was attracted to the idea of building things. I like the idea of taking something from a bunch of scraps of metal and then turning it into something functional, right? Talk about it personal too, right? Add, a, add an extra level of dimension. Maybe you never had a computer growing up. Maybe... You know, ever since you started playing with Legos as a kid, you knew that you wanted to do something like this. Make it personal to you. What do you add to our campus? I think I already talked about this. So I'll move on to the next question, which is, how would your friends describe you? They, they ask this a lot. How would your friends describe you? How would your parents describe you? How would your teachers describe you? Provide adjectives, then provide an anecdote exactly like how that is illustrated. What is the biggest problem facing the world? That's a more broader question. They kind of want to get your perspective on life. Um, don't answer something really political, right? Like over taxation. Um, instead, answer with a, a problem that's universal. You know, maybe healthcare isn't as good as it used to be, or maybe 
um, the democracy in the US isn't as strong as it should be. And if you could spend an afternoon with any person in the world, who would it be? Just be ready to be answered. Just be ready to be asked questions that you couldn't possibly prepare for. Those other questions, like what attracts you to this major, what do you add to our campus? Those are the ones you prepare for by writing them down on a document and then writing down the answers and then practicing the answers. But for some of these questions, you literally just can't practice them because they're so uncommon, you, you really can't predict them. In, those case, in that case, just be ready to be overwhelmed. Be ready to be surprised and be ready to thrive in that environment. Now let's take a look at some of the essays that we've seen at Assured, because we believe that essays are the most important part of this process. Here's example, essay number one. We have a prospective computer science major who had done all the Olympiads, who had done all the IT stuff. And the unrevised essay is this. Spanish, French, Hindi, Python, Java, JavaScript. Languages are the love of my life. While other boys and girls pick up baseball bats, flutes, and essays, I spend my time learning the intricacies of syntax. Growing up in a multilingual family, I learned the value of language fluency from a young age. As a high school student, I applied that principle to life using computer science, which are, is almost important as real life languages. Sorry, just moved my phone so I guess when I was in the third grade, I picked up my fourth language Italian, it bristled me with excitement. All right, so you might think this essay is good, you might think it's bad, but on the next slide, we're gonna highlight exactly some of the things that you know, didn't go well in this essay. First of all, their opening hook, the thing that drags in the reader's attention, didn't really serve to do that. It was just a list of six languages. Three of them were real, three of them were computer languages. That doesn't draw me in. It makes me confused, especially if I don't know that those three last languages are computer languages. I think it's a snake, and I think it's an island in, in Indonesia. And I think, what even is JavaScript? And we go on to, while other boys and girls pick up baseball bats, boots, and essays. You really want to show you're exceptional, like Quintaro said, but you don't want to do it by downplaying everybody else's accomplishments or saying that they all um, mold into the same person. That's not the way to do it. It makes you look kind of, what's the best word for it? it makes you look kind of disdainful, right? Then, you know, word choice is really important. The student, this student said, I apply the principle of life to com com computer languages. Principle of life is a little bit broad, right? We don't wanna be using that kind of a word. If you're with an essay editor, they're gonna let you know that. Um, and then lastly, I guess, it bristled me with excitement. Another example of word choice. Overall, this essay really lacks a cohesive structure. I don't know where it's going. I don't know where it's coming from. I don't know what to expect to come next. The student talks about their love of languages. And then they talk about how as high school students, as a high school student, they adopted computer languages. And then for some reason, they go back in the last paragraph and talk about how um, they learned Italian in third grade. See, this is just an excerpt from a common app, but it just goes to show that structure, as well as word choice, a good hook, and you know, important details will get you there. But abandoning all those things and just being reckless with your use of language won't. Let's look at how this essay became a good one through Assured. Spanish was the hardest for me, not because I couldn't pro project my mother's brisk Cuban accent onto my own lips, but because I never felt the efficiencies and contractions I'd previously seen in English, Chinese, and Russian. Honestly, I said, looking down at my copy of Don Quio, maybe it's time for Spanish to grow. There needs to be updates to the language. My mother smiled from across the room. I was 14 years old at the time, and I had been collecting languages for as long as I could utter words. Every day, she saw these magazine cutouts from Juventud Rebelde, Leops, and Murzurka, international magazines from across the world. Each one displayed a novel concatenation of syntax components and vocabulary terms. Whenever I encountered a new style of literary linguistic design, a light went off in my head. By high school, my ability to judge and compare dialects made me gravitate towards programming languages. Let's see, another excerpt from the same comment app, but this one is really good. This one really tells a narrative. It really draws my attention in by omitting detail rather than keeping it. Spanish was the hardest word for you, right? Oh, your mother has a Cuban accent? That's interesting to know. Maybe that'll be coming up later as part of your identity. Oh. You already learned three languages. Oh, wow. This was all by the time you're 14. The sequential progression of details here is really masterful. And that's what really gets it across to the reader. For this next essay, we're not going to look at you know, the before and after. I'm going to show the before. I'm going to show some of the problems. And then I'm going to encourage you to, when you get the PowerPoint sent to you, which is what we're going to do, we're going to be sending the PowerPoint to you. Um, take a look at yourself. Um, take a look at it yourself. Make sure that you can understand you know, how we became better with our edits. And then the same thing for the third essay. So let's look at this last essay. 
um, international relations major. Every day we come closer to the end of humanity at the hands of climate change. Climate change may as well be the fifth horseman of the apocalypse. It seems nothing can truly stop it. In fact, millions have already died as a result of its consequences. This is why I decided to join the youth climate strike. I use my skills as the climate coordinator for my SGA's organized rallies. I earn recognition in local newspapers and I use that motivation to keep going. Okay, see, this one isn't bad. There's a lot of good details here. I learned a lot of things, but it's really formatted like a, a Wikipedia pages. I wanna hear a story. I wanna hear what these activities mean to the person. I wanna hear why their approach to this uh, protest was different than the approaches of all the other climate protests in New York, in Los Angeles, in Bogota, in Delhi, right? So let's look at specifically some of the problems that exist in this, on this next slide. First of all, this entire first paragraph doesn't even mention the, read, the, the writer at all. It's entirely impersonal. And that's the problem with this essay. You need to make sure that every sentence is so good and is so personal that literally no other person in the world would be able to write it because it didn't apply to them. It's not the case with this first paragraph. It's about a world problem, not about how this world problem affected the reader. And that's a serious problem. This is why I decided to join as the start of the second paragraph. That's not a strong way to start a paragraph. It doesn't really draw on the reader. It doesn't really have a good transition. It's kind of basic, right? That's something that Assured knows that not a lot of people do. Um, I use my skills as a climate coordinator for my SGA to organize rallies, earn recognition, and then I use that as commitment to keep going. That recognition isn't what should be keeping you going. Your love for protesting and your love for the world is what should keep you going, not recognition. That's called over-justification, and it's a psychological problem that the admissions reader might realize that you wouldn't if you hadn't had a friend or an expert look at your essay ahead of time. All right, so on this next slide, we just have you know, the better version of the essay, and then the slides after that, the next three slides are the same thing for our third essay, which is an IB student applying as a women's studies major. This one's a passion essay. I really, really, really encourage you to take a look at it. Now, Lintaro, I believe, is going to be talking about our mission. Go ahead, Lintaro. Definitely. So now you're probably thinking, what do I do with all this information? How can I apply this to my own admissions journey? Well, at Assured, we can help you do just that, because our mission at Assured is to assure student success in the college admissions process, most especially for international students from India. How do we do that? Well. We provide accessible, affordable, and a la carte college consulting services. We provide personal statement edits for $99.99. These cover one full round of edits per purchase, but they're not just gonna be any edits. We're gonna edit that essay quantitatively. We're gonna look at the impressions that we get for each little thing, each little trait an admissions officer is gonna want to evaluate you for. Are you humble? Are you kind? Does this essay make you seem intellectually vital and curious? We're going to be ranking that essay based on other essays we've seen according to those criteria. With our edits, we'll also be providing a plethora of comments. These comments are not just going to be, oh, this word could be changed. This line might be a little bit bad. We're going to ask you those hard questions that the admissions officers themselves will want to ask you. Why did you like this activity? What did it mean to start this new organization? What did it mean to take this class with that teacher at Elpro? We want you to get depth out of every single edit, essay edit that you accomplish with us. We offer a one week turnaround time for those essay edits. However, we also have a three day express option. We also offer supplemental edits. So these are those supplemental essays. Some schools require them, some don't, but most schools do want you to fill these out because they add to what your application narrative can be. We charge 14 cents per word for each of those essays and your total price is gonna be based on the length of your submission. So if you have a thousand words that you want us to edit, that's gonna be pricier than if you just have 100 words. Like with the personal statement, each purchase covers one full round of deep edits. Your essay can answer any prompt from any school and we offer the same turnaround times there. However, we are also super excited to mention this next product to you. And this is our mock interview product. We have a limited supply of these, only 30 signups available. And we are making this product, which we normally do not offer exclusively, exclusively open to the attendees of this webinar. 
Our normal price for such a product would be $299.99, but for those attendees of this webinar, we are offering a limited 50% discount to $149.99. This is an unparalleled opportunity to get real admissions interview experience with actual Ivy League Plus students who will use actual Ivy League Plus questions that they themselves were asked in this college process. It's gonna be a 45 minute interview with a 15 minute debrief and we really hope you take advantage. So how do you purchase our products? Well, to purchase our products, you have two options and both of these are going to be linked in the chat. First, if you're not ready to purchase our products but are still interested and want to be on our mailing list, please fill out the following form, tinyurl.com slash assured dash form. However, if you're ready to purchase our products and you want to get into priority contact with us, please go to www.assuredglobalconsulting.com slash services. That's assuredglobalconsulting.com slash services. To access the mock interview 50% discount, you can just put in the promo code LIMITED30, that's all caps. However, for our other admissions products, specifically the essay edits, you can just enter the promo code ELPRO L -PRO, for a 20% discount on essays. And we're gonna put that up at the end and we'll make sure that y'all when we ask questions, we'll have access to that information. So very quickly, what did y'all learn here today? Rather, what did we all learn here today? First, to succeed in the American college admissions process, you're gonna to have to build that Everest-like spike. You have to be extraordinary. But being extraordinary doesn't mean you have to be mean to other people. It doesn't mean you have to stay up every single night trying to, to win as many awards as you can. Everyone in this world is different. By extraordinary, we just mean showcase what differences you already have, what any normal human being would have as part of his individuality. The thing is, not a lot of people can do that. So if you can do that, if you can showcase your individualness just by being yourself, you can stand out. And of course, combine that passion, that spike, that uniqueness with good academics. If you don't have the basics, the fundamentals, why would any college accept you? They'd be taking a risk, an expensive one at that too. Once you have your spike, your passion set, generate a narrative, make it one sentence. What do you want the colleges to think when they see you, when they think about you. Next, you have to evidence that narrative. They're not gonna just take you at your word. Each piece of your application should support your narrative. It should add something new to that foundation. However, remember, repetition in college admissions essays is only good if you're using it for a very specific rhetorical effect. And even I can't do that. I'm not even that good of a writer. Don't repeat ideas unless that repetition can provide some new value. It is always good in college admissions to provide something new, something new that the admissions reader can sort of gnaw on when they're thinking about accepting you. Next, and this is the most important step, you have to execute that evidence well. Conquer your essays, conquer your interview. Assured can help with that. Finally, and this goes for the entire application process, from every email you're sending to the college to every single interaction you have with your interviewer. Know the effect that you want to create in the mind of the college admissions office and create it. Make it as clear as possible. Ponder it every single time you think of college admissions. How is that college admissions officer going to see me? And how can I make that effect? as good and as beneficial as possible for my application chances. Remember, getting into American schools is hard. Getting into any school is hard, let's be honest. The name of the game is maximizing your chances of getting into an American school. And maximizing your chances means maximizing your individuality, your ability to be remembered, and most simply, your extraordinary abilities. So are there any questions? I'm going to shut the presentation off right now. 
I know y'all have been waiting patiently, so please feel free to raise your hand. We'll just go through those questions right away. Or if you want to ask in the chat, feel free. Okay, we have a question from Ame to everyone. My top college on my list is Dartmouth. What personal tips would you recommend for enhancing my application? I say in narrative. Also, I'm a senior and will be applying to Dartmouth early decision in five months. What could you recommend for that too? Ame, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. I'll be very frank with you. Um, I don't know anything about you, so I can't give you personal tips, but the best thing that I can tell you is Dartmouth loves people who love Dartmouth, if that makes sense. In the Why Dartmouth essay, which is going to be your most important essay, stress that you have very clear ideas of what you'll do on campus. Stress that you've done your research. I'd say research a couple classes that you want to take specifically at Dartmouth, mention those professors, mention those class, classes. Also, I'd research one or two of Dartmouth's specific institutes. We have a lot of different public policy research centers um, and just disciplinary research centers. Research what opportunities they have. Talk about how you might like to take advantage of one of them. And Dartmouth people love the outdoors. So make sure you mention the outdoors and don't say that you hate the cold because I promise you then Dartmouth will not be your top college anymore because Dartmouth is very cold during the winter. And for early decision, Dartmouth loves people who love Dartmouth. Early decision means you love Dartmouth. If you apply early decision, it does not guarantee your admission, but it raises your chances of admission considerably. Okay. okay. Let me take the next three questions. All right. The first one is, how did you find gigs or opportunities in public speaking that would actually make an impact in your application? That's a great question. First of all, I made some of those gigs myself. I started a debate company that taught debates to middle school students. That was an entrepreneurial endeavor that showed how much public speaking mattered to me. Another thing was I was a member of the International Public Policy Forum debate tournaments. So this is an international tournament that you guys can do too with, with um, approval from your teachers. Um, I was second place in the world out of 180 teams. So I really showed the fact that my success was global. I was also uh, nationally awarded in the National Speech and Debate Tournaments, which has local levels of competition. And I just did a lot of debate tournaments on the circuits. All right, the next one is, sir, if I wanna be a historian, can I get admissions in Stanford University? Yes, you can, if you mean Stanford. Um, if you mean another school, yes, too. Um, all these schools want a diverse amount of students, right? Just because Stanford is known for computer science doesn't mean it doesn't also want to have some of the world's best historians graduate from there. You want to show why you want to be a historian in your application. Stanford has a particular question that is, what is meaningful to you and why? In that essay, you can talk about, you know, why history is meaningful to you, or maybe why another field is also meaningful to you and why you want to combine it with history. Stanford also has another question that says, if you could go back in time and witness, witness one moment in history, what would it be? And they want you to explain that in 50 words. I explained when Marco Polo first met, um, I believe it was Kublai Khan. It was a couple hundred years ago, close to a millennia ago. Um, Montaro in his essay talked about, um, I think a riot that had taken place in the 20th century in the US and why it was really important to him. So really leverage those essays to talk about all of your experiences with history and why it's important. As a 10th grader, what can I do to be extraordinary? Well, I would say that comes down to what you're interested in. Take something that you're really interested in. Maybe it's computer science, right? And then make an activity out of that that not a lot of other people are doing, right? It's always better to create something um, that you really like than it is to join another club or to join a, even a debate circuit, right? So these things do matter, right? Those things like clubs, those things like um, being on a sports team or whatever, those things can really help you, but you can also really differentiate yourself by taking your own path, right? Take an interest, create kind of your own endeavor with it. All these colleges will tell you, especially Harvard, I think, it's always better for our graduates to create a job than to find a job. They want the same thing with their applicants, right? In addition, you can also work on getting to that point by st establishing strong connections with your teachers so they can write you really good letters of recommendation. Um, and then that'll help make sure that you're in a prime position to succeed. Do we one consult quick for thing on that? Oh, sorry, yeah. sorry. Oh, no, go ahead. Go one, on. one quick thing for uh, Dirga, Dirja. I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing that wrong, but one of the things that I mentioned on my personal narrative, my getting the congressional internship 
along with my youth governor of Maryland job. I had no, no government related activities on my resume until the end of my sophomore year of high school. If you're a sophomore, it might not seem like you have tons of time, but you actually do have tons of time. If you have a passion and you devote 10 hours a week to it, I can almost guarantee that if you do it truly from the heart, you put yourself into it, you work your darndest to get people behind your idea, awards, recognition, projects to pursue, they will come to you. I encourage you more than anything, spend the summer just thinking about yourself. What do you like to do? And how can you leverage that? How can you help people around you? Colleges especially love that sort of introspection when it comes to activities. And then we also have a question from Anaga. Can you shine some light on the financial aid aspect for international students? This is gonna be a lot of detail. I don't wanna take away from anyone else's questions, uh, but very simply, many colleges recommend two things. Uh, one, fill out the FAFSA. This is the Federal Application for Student Aid. For federal, this is the application for federal student aid. Uh, most of you will not be eligible for federal student aid. Most of that goes to United States citizens, but colleges use this FAFSA to determine financial aid eligibility, even for internationals. So you're gonna have to fill that out. It asks for yearly income, what assets your family owns, things like that. There's also gonna be something called the CSS profile. Some colleges require it, some don't. It's much more in detail. It asks very similar financial questions. The goal of these two things is just to find out how much your family can pay for college, as in how much can it be affordable for your family to pay for college. Um, it will come up with a so-called estimated cost of attendance. Um, many need-based institutions like Yale, Harvard, they try to match their students' financial aid need. They'll use that number to calculate their financial aid packages. Uh, we also have a question from Srinikesh. Srinikesh. Uh, he says that I'm interested in automobiles. Um, if you're interested in that, you could definitely go to a United States trade school. However, if you're more interested in engineering, um, we can definitely help on that front. Um, Gautam and Sharyar both have tons of experience with engineering schools. And then I got another question from Seymour, Sharyar, Gautam. Feel free to jump in here. He says, oh. I just had a general question about SATs and R batch. Um, I'm not happy with my scores and I'm debating whether I should give them a second time. I'm worried how big of a difference a few extra months of preparation can make, especially considering I, can, that I don't have to submit. Yeah. Okay. So how important are the SATs in a college application? So they're actually really not that important, but you can use them as a way to show your academic strengths, right? I took the SAT twice. The first time I got a 1530 out of 1600. It's a really good score. It's 99th percentile but I felt that I could do better. And just the fact that I felt that I could do better with a few months of small, but really targeted training was enough for me to decide to take it again. And the second time I got a perfect score of 1600. Honestly though, if you just get above, I think, if you just find your school's um, average SAT score range on Google, you know, just search up, maybe you wanna to go to USC, search up USC middle 50% SAT, it'll show you on average what the students get right? Um, and then try to make your way into that range, right? Don't try to, don't overdo it, right? Don't try to get to a 1600 um, if you think that you can't get there or you think it's going to take too much time. Really, there are better ways to spend your time than in doing that. Um, I'm going to try to answer these questions a little bit more rapidly. Um, so do you consult for master's programs? Not really one of our targets, but if you have an essay you want to submit to a master's program, feel free to send it our way. We'll take a look at it. We'll do the whole charging process and then we'll send it back to you because overall essays matter no matter which part of the process you're in. I'm sure, looking to send my daughter. The, sorry, uh, could I take one quick question? Sure, yeah, go ahead. Okay, um, so Prakar asked, if you could, what would you say is the single most important factor in college admissions? Two things, if you don't have the best grades or at least the grades that qualify you for a school, you will not get seriously considered. So to get your foot in the door, so to speak, you need to have good SAT scores, good grades. After that, by far, the most important thing is personality. They want to know that you have a passion that you can contribute to college. Even if you have sort of middling grades, middling scores, having an amazing ability to talk to people, be compassionate, having amazing academic abilities. And these can definitely be the abilities that you might develop in an IB program specifically in an extended essay project or in other research projects where you're doing real academic work, something that can make you stand out like that 
can outweigh any impacts of bad grades, truly bad grades, or even a middling SAT score. So keep that in mind. Um, after you have the grades, personality matters most. But if personality can be strong enough, it can outweigh many weaknesses in your application. OK, I agree with, with all of that. Um, and it's just true. Let's look at uh, Ankita's question. I'm looking at sending my daughter to USA for undergrad. She's in class eights. I'm assuming that means grade eights, similar to what we have in the US. Um, what would you recommend as an intermediate action, as immediate action for her to build her profile? Find her interests, set goals for those interests. So if she wants to do debates, set goals for what she would constantly accomplish in debates. Find some other people who are doing the same things who are older than her, right? That would really help her. I had some, I had um, Quintaro and Gautam are both older than me. They both mentored me through the debate process. Um, and that really helped me get it across, right? Essays are a mandate at a lot of the most successful schools, actually at all of them, at a lot of the most selective schools. There are some schools that don't require essays. You may be able to find them, um, but yeah, most of them do. I wanna be in medical, so which college university would you recommend? And what experience do you think it would be helpful to get into a medical college? I will tell you this about medical schools. The exact college you go to in the US isn't the most important thing. You wanna be going to a US, colleges, a US college where you can get a 4.0 because that really matters for medical school admissions, where you can do volunteering at a hospital and where you can make sure to get good recommendations and have a good experience overall. Duke is very famous for pre-med because there is a surrounding community of medical institutions and because you know, if you're really smart and you're really smart enough to get in, you can get a 4.0. Overall, just try to take a look at that, right? Some schools, are kind of disguised as really good pre-med schools when in reality it's really hard to get good grades and a lot of their students don't get it. Most schools that are really good at pre-med will publish their pre-med accepted their medical school acceptance rates. If you're if you're an eighth grader you don't need to worry about getting into medical school school right now. Uh, you need to be worried about trying to build up that extracurricular profile getting good grades so you can get into undergrad. Um, One student asked a great question, can sports help you in applying to international colleges? Most definitely. If you're great at sports in India, there is a whole process of athletic recruiting for American schools. Now, some sports are very competitive, like football. I highly doubt that there are any Indian football leagues, especially at the school level. And by football, I mean American gridiron football, not soccer. I'm just making that clear. However, there are also some very niche sports. If you're good at cricket, if you're good at tennis, if you're good at swimming, horseback riding, let us know. There are some schools that have those teams and they are desperate for athletes to join, especially athletes who have actually had long-term experience in it. Um, so sports can definitely help you in applying to international colleges. Uh, I have another question. Can you get in without any extracurriculars? Yes, you can, but not to Harvard, not to Stanford, not to schools like that, unless you have an amazing background. And by amazing background, I mean, you have to have survived the war and regained the use of your legs after being paralyzed. You have to have a truly outrageous, you know, world inspiring story without extracurriculars, or at least without a sincere passion and accomplishments to back it up. Um, a school like Harvard is very sadly not going to give you a second look. Uh, okay, can I just say something right now? We're not going to be able to get to all these questions by seven o'clock. We might stay a little bit after, but for some of these schools, like um, for some of these questions, like how much percentage, what's like Stanford's acceptance percentage, please find those answers on Google. They're available for you. Um, Yuvraj, do you have a quick question? I see your hand is raised. Just letting you know that your hand is up if you don't have a question. By the way, a reminder for everybody, please fill out the form that we put in the chat recently. Um, if you're interested in learning more about our products, please buy our products if you're interested. Really, if you want to get an advantage, you got to make sure you're having somebody look at these at the um, at the essays. Just like me, when I was in 12th grade, I can see a lot of little typos here in the chat. Um, those typos can really go a long way when they show maybe that you're not uh, as good of an English speaker as you really are to these admissions readers. What should I keep in mind while applying to MIT? Well, it's a STEM school. They're a very meritorious school, which means luck actually plays less of a role than it does for schools like Stanford. Um, 
but yeah, just make sure your essays are good. They don't require the common application essay. They have their own essay um, process. The MIT application portal is where you want to look. It's completely different than every other school. Um, I'm interested in doing a BBA. Any suggestions from what I can do? So bat, uh, business undergrad is a good choice. Um, try to focus on business related events or tech related events during high school. Um, and then look at the specific colleges that you want to go to and find profiles at those schools. University of Michigan, University of Pennsylvania, Cornell and um, USC are some options off the top of my head that can help you get there. Um, I have a question um, from you, Raj. Oh, sorry, Gon. Sorry, yeah, could I just interrupt real quick? So um, a lot of these questions, uh, if you do the sign up form, which I just linked in the chat, tinyurl.com slash assured form, we'll send out weekly emails or bi-weekly emails that might actually reveal a lot of the information that you have questions on. So please make sure to sign up because um, it, we might actually help answer your questions later on. And we might also help answer questions you didn't know you had on different American topics. So that's the URL link there. It's also in our presentation. Um, but yeah, please find it in the chat and sign up so you can have your questions answered. So a question from you, Raj, what are the main criteria I should look upon when I fill out the application? He does say that he might specifically look for schools like Stanford. Um, Stanford's a hard one. We don't even know how many applications they get each year because the number grew so much and the acceptance rate is so low. They were scared of scaring people away. Um, with the amount of applications that Stanford gets and the competitiveness of the pool, I'm going to say it, it's your chance to be risky. Be as memorable as possible in your essays, in your extracurriculars. Each admissions officer probably reads upwards of 100 to 200 applications a day um, or in a couple of days. You have to stand out, make everything as personal, as funny, whatever you need to do to be memorable, as long as it's not bad as possible. Okay, so we're at 703 right now. Um, and I wanna make sure that everybody has time to go on to, you know, if you have classes or homework today. So if you wanna see some answers to these remaining questions, um, if that's okay with Ms. Uganda, we can continue answering them. Um, if not though, um, please fill out our form and get in contact with us. Um, so yeah, I'm see, sure uh, the students can use the form as well. Uh, while, you know, I mean, of course, there is always a paucity of time, but I think we can look at uh, answering two or three questions more. Uh, you know, the questions which you guys feel, you know, that fit and require uh, to be addressed on this platform. And post that, of course, we will encourage our students to get in touch, to fill up the form. And uh, students make the most of this uh, opportunity because here you have experts who are going to give you the absolute right insights, uh, who are going to help you with this entire process. So do make use of this opportunity. And uh, Sharyar, uh, if there are any other questions, I think we have time to address three or four more questions. Okay. Um, if this question hasn't been answered yet, I really want to hammer this one down. It's from Monica, I believe, saying, which grade does a student start preparing for undergrad admissions? I would say, and forgive me if it's already been answered, um, I would say it's ninth grade. In ninth grade, you have to start getting the good grades that are necessary, or the first year of high school, if you're going to a specific high school that has a different um, system. But that's the grade that you start exploring your interests, identifying what kind of activities that you want to do. And that's the grade where you start fostering relationships with teachers and building up your academic resume. Oh, another really good question. Is there any particular limit to the essay that will be submitted? Yes. The essay that you submit um, is going to have a word limit on it. Uh, the common application is 250 to 650 words. If it's less than 250 words or greater than 650 words, they're literally not going to submit the essay for you through the portal. Um, other schools, every essay that you write for these for these schools has a word limit. The exception exception being U Chicago and Harvard, who have no word limits, but really they do. They just want you to figure it out on your own, and that's another thing. You know, you kind of need help with that. What would you recommend about letters of recommendation, and what about a great letter LOR should I have and talk about? Excellent question. Your great letter of recommendation should give us insights into who you are as a person and what you contribute to the classroom environment. And specifically, a lot of schools ask for two letters. One of them can come from a teacher who's in your field of interest. So if you're a biology student, you want to do that. You can have a bio or a chem teacher write that and talk about how great of a and talk about how great of a biology student you are. And, and then the other one, you could have a teacher from 
an entirely different subject. Talk about that. Um, I see a great question. Are languages considered as extracurricular activities? Most definitely. I don't know. Some of you might be bilingual, trilingual, maybe even quadrilingual. Bring that up in your application. There will actually be a space in the application form itself, not even in the essays, where you can bring that up. Being multilingual, it's an amazing skill. Far too many Americans are not multilingual. If you have many languages that you speak, that is one way to stand out in the application process. And to be very clear, colleges love to see independent study. If you've taught yourself a language, milk that for all that it is worth. Teaching yourself a language is harder than starting any organization in my book. I, I take Russian at Dartmouth right now, so I'm sort of going through the struggle of learning a language. Most definitely, languages can be considered extracurricular activities. Okay, so I guess with that, those are the last questions. There are a few more. Some of these you can answer yourselves on Google, like I mentioned, for example, which schools facilitate cricket teams. Um, so yeah, if you want to get in contact with us, we really encourage you to do. We really encourage it. Um, you try to get as much help as you can in this process, especially with you know experienced people. Um, go ahead and do that through our form, or go to our website and book an appointment or book a essay edit. Um, really, right now, if you're if you're a 12th grader and you're trying to apply to US college, right now is the time to get started, or a few months ago actually. So get started with those essays. Make sure that they're perfect and pristine, and use the promo codes LPRO and the mock interview promo code limited 30. Thank you guys so, so much for being here and listening to us today. And I really wish you all the best of luck in the admissions process because it can really transform your life once you do get in. It was a pleasure guys. Thank you so much for being an attentive audience.